Thank you for watching this Syncopation software tutorial video. Syncopation software develops and supports the DPL family of decision tree software products in DPMX, a decision analysis based portfolio prioritization system. In this video, I will start where I left off in the first and continue to build up my parametric spreadsheet model in Excel. Up to this point, I've set up two sheets within my Excel workbook. I've defined global parameters and have incorporated market demand. Now I'm going to calculate sales from demand. It's important to note that demand is not a direct input of sales. We can only serve as much demand as we have capacity to do so. So next I'll incorporate capacity into the spreadsheet, which is uncertain. In fact, it's a decision that I'd like to optimize. The three decision alternatives for capacity are small, medium, or large. On the input sheet, I'm going to have Excel select a capacity alternative from a table via a flag value. I like my decision inputs on the top, so I'll insert the capacity decision above my global parameters. I'll enter the label in column B and a flag value of 1 for now in column D. I'll name the cell D4 capacity. Off to the right, starting with column G, I'm going to create a one row table for the capacity values. It should look like the following. I'll name the range H5 through J5, capacity underscore table. I want cell E4 to display the current capacity value given the flag in cell D4. So I'll enter a formula that uses Excel's index function. I'll name the cell E4 capacity underscore value for use in the cash flow calculations. This isn't mandatory, but it's usually helpful to have a column off to the right that contains notes about the assumptions. I'll also do a bit of quick formatting here. Now I'll bring this capacity information over to the cash flows by referencing capacity value across all years. I can check that the capacity values update correctly by changing the flag value within cell D6 on the input sheet. As I said previously, we can only serve as much demand as we have capacity for. Therefore, I'm going to create a row for demand serve that employs Excel's min function to take whatever is less, total demand, or capacity, to calculate sales. Before I start totaling sales, recall that there are variables that will affect one decision alternative differently than the other. If we expanded and developed, we will have the benefit of lower COGS and CAPEX, but we could suffer supply disruptions and tariffs may be levied on widgets sold to the emerging market. On the other hand, if we build new and emerging, we don't need to worry about tariffs or supply disruptions, but COGS and CAPEX will be higher. Note that due to these tariffs, I'd prefer to satisfy demand within the developed market completely before selling to the emerging market. This will be reflected within our formula for emerging market sales. I need to incorporate this expansion location decision switch in the ensuing asymmetry into the cash flow calculations. I'll set up a decision switch at the top of my input sheet. I'll label it expansion location within column B. I'll enter a flag value of 1 for now within column D. I'll name the cell expansion underscore location. I'm going to use flag values to identify each decision alternative. 1 will represent expand and developed, and 2 will represent build new and emerging. I'll make note of this within my Notes column. We'll employ these flag values within if-then statements in the cash flows. Now that we've got a handle on capacity and demand, we need to define the price we'll get for each widget sold to calculate sales. I'll first enter the price of $75 on the input sheet, and we'll name cell D16 price. We'll switch over to the cash flows to calculate sales for each market. Calculating developed market sales is straightforward. It's simply demand times price. I'll employ absolute references to copy the data quickly across the cash flows. For emerging market sales, we'll subtract the developed market demand value in row 7 from the demand served in row 17 and then multiply the difference by price, again using an absolute reference. 
This indicates that we prefer to satisfy the developed market demand completely before we sell to the emerging market. I'll enter a row of total sales by multiplying total demand served by price. If we were to produce all of our widgets within a single facility in the developed market, there is a possibility of suffering production issues, which will result in supply disruptions. I'll model supply disruptions as a percentage of demand served. If we suffer no disruption, we'll serve 100% of demand. If we suffer some disruptions, we'll serve 90. And if we suffer severe disruptions, we'll serve only 40%. I'll enter 100% within cell D18. I'll name it supply underscore disruption, and we'll enter explanatory notes off to the right. On the cash flow sheet, I'll update the total demand serve formula to include my first if statement to this effect. If the expansion location is expand and develop, we need to multiply demand served by the supply disruption percentage. Now that we've added up our revenues, we need to incorporate our costs. First up is COGS, or Costs of Goods Sold, which will be modeled as a percentage of sales. Recall that COGS will be higher if we build a new facility within the emerging market. On the input sheet, I'll label it and we'll enter a value of 10%. A row below, I'll include a COGS multiplier of 95%, which will lower COGS for the expand and developed alternative. I'll name both for use in cash flows. Now I'll bring this into the cash flows. I'm going to calculate this row of costs and we'll subtract it later from revenues. I'll use another if statement here. In other words, if we expand and develop, COGS is 9.5% of sales, otherwise it's 10%. Now for the tariffs. I'll first enter this variable on the input sheet by labeling, naming, and providing notation. There will be a tariff of 5% levied on sales in the emerging market, only if we expand and developed. So I'll calculate this row of costs within the cash flows using another if statement. If we expand and develop, we need to multiply the tariff rate by emerging market sales, which will eventually subtract from revenues. I'm going to change the decision switch in order to check that COGS and tariffs move in the right direction, which they do. We'll calculate our EBITDA earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization now before incorporating CapEx, taxes, and the discount rate. The calculation is total sales minus COGS and tariffs. Back on the input sheet beneath tariffs, I'm going to incorporate our CapEx. I'll enter a flag value of 1 within column D for now. This flag will correspond to the low, nominal, or high outcomes of CapEx, as I'll indicate in my notes column. CapEx is uncertain and dependent upon both capacity level and expansion location. So I'm going to create a set of three 2x3 two tables. The first column identifies the capacity level and the second identifies the two expansion locations via flag values for each capacity level. To the right, I'll set up three columns for low, nominal, and high CapEx given the capacity level and expansion location. Here's how the table should be set up. I'm going to separate the tables by capacity level. I'll name I26 through K27 CapEx table small, I28 through K29 CapEx table medium, and the last two rows CapEx table large. Within column E, I'll enter a formula that employs index and choose functions to find the appropriate CapEx value given capacity and expansion location.
I'll name the cell capex underscore value for use in the cache flows. Notice that when the flags are set to expand and developed or 1, medium capacity 2, and low capex 1, the value of capex is 720. To check that the capex value formula and tables work properly, I'm going to change these flags. More specifically, I'm going to set the flags so that the capex value is 1638. So I'll set expansion location to 2, or build new, capacity to 3, large, and capex to 2, nominal. It looks like this is working correctly. Lastly, I'm going to incorporate the capex into cash flows. I'll split capex evenly between the first two years of cash flows, then I'll enter zeros for the rest of the years. Recall that the tax rate being applied to earnings is 25%. We'll incorporate this into our cash flows now by multiplying row 28 by our tax rate. Now I'm ready to calculate free cash flow, which is EBITDA minus CAPEX minus tax. From this, I can calculate my discount of free cash flows by applying the discount rate from the input sheet. First, I'll create a row labeled Discount Factor. For 2018, I'll enter 100%. For the next year, it's the previous cell divided by 1 plus the discount rate. I'll use an absolute reference for the discount factor and we'll copy this to the subsequent years. To calculate discounted free cash flows, I'll multiply free cash flow by the discount factor. Finally, we need to set up the output for the discounted cash flow model, NPV which is the sum of the discounted cash flows. I'll name the cell NPV in the name box. And for completion's sake, I'll include the model output NPV on the input sheet as well. Hmm, for this particular scenario, NPV is negative. I'm going to go ahead and update some of the flags so we have a positive NPV. We've now completed our parametric cash flow spreadsheet. From this point, it would be easy to link this model to DPL using the switches on the input sheet as drivers for decisions and uncertainties and NPV as the output metric. In conclusion, I'd like to review a few best practices to keep in mind when building a parametric spreadsheet model in Excel. Organization. It's best to group all inputs and outputs to the spreadsheet model on a sheet that is separate from the calculations. Simplicity. The parameter sheet should be high level and free of excess detail. In other words, if you're linking it to a DPL model, it should be at the same level of detail as the influence diagram and decision tree. The more detailed the model is, the more difficult it is to incorporate and maintain the necessary flexibility. Further, a decision-making level of detail is not the same as an accounting or reporting level of detail. When you're dealing with an uncertain future, it's more important to get the scenarios right than to chase down every penny. Consistency. Be consistent throughout the spreadsheet when naming your ranges, particularly if there's a lot of them. Is it discount underscore rate, discount rate with no spaces, or just DR? These are all okay, but naming conventions should be consistent throughout. Be sure to employ these new range names rather than sheet cell references when data moves between sheets. Using a color code for decision switches, uncertainties, value metrics, and assumptions can be helpful if you'll be linking these ranges to a DPL model. Do care and attention. Remember that you're building this model because your organization has an important decision to make. Adhering to these best practices will make it easier to validate your model and will make sure the advice you give is correct. This is the conclusion of the second and final Building a Parametric Spreadsheet tutorial. I hope you found these best practices and the tutorial helpful. Thank you for watching.